for solving for X uh, for today's lesson. A blank slide show here. All right, so the first thing that we're going to want to go ahead and take a minute to record uh, would be our definition for the zero product property. That's on there for you. Uh, it basically says that if you have two values, A and B, and you multiply them together to get zero, then either A or B must be zero. So if A times B equals zero, then either A equals zero or B equals zero, or my personal favorite, both could be zero. So we're going to play a little game. You're going to read my mind. It's going to be fun. Uh, so I'm thinking of a number. This is to test your understanding of the zero product property. Thinking of a number. My daughter loves to play this game all the time. Mommy, I'm thinking of a number. Okay, so I'm thinking of a number. And you could take this number and multiply it by any number under the sun and get zero back out. Who can read my mind? I'll say it again. You ready? Think, think, think. I'm thinking of a number that I could take and multiply by any other number under the sun and I can get zero back out. What is it? Yeah, I hear it in a couple places. Zero is the answer to that question because zero times any other number is zero. If you understand that fun fact, you intrinsically have a uh, like a pretty decent understanding of the zero product property. Uh, and it does say, you know, if we have A times B equals zero, then hey, one of these two things or both uh, has to be equal to zero. To give you an example of how this relates to what we're doing with factoring and all that, I'm going to grab a problem from your warm up. So let's go back here. Part D. I like that one. I'm going to use it. Steal this guy here. Copy. And paste. Okay, this guy is a factored form of a quadratic equation. And what I'm going to teach you how to do today is solve for x in a quadratic equation. Now that helps us do a number of things. We'll get into the application of it a little later on. But the how to do it is kind of what I need you to understand for today. So you're going to see problems not that look like this, but that have one small modification. They're going to be set equal to zero, turning them from what we know as expressions into equations. Equations are ultimately expressions that have equal signs in between them. So I have now just taken a factored expression and set it equal to zero. Now, do you see what I just did and how this could be solved using the zero product property? What I have up here on the smart board right now are two factors. One of them is 3x plus 2, essentially behaving like a in our zero product property. And the other factor is 2x plus 5, essentially behaving like b in my zero product property. Well, if I multiply these two things together, and they must equal zero, well then one of those two things or both must actually be zero. In other words, this thing here needs to be zero or this thing here needs to be zero if this expression is ultimately going to equate to zero. That's awesome because that gives me a technique that helps me solve for x. I could set 3x plus 2 equal to zero or I could set 2x plus 5 equal to zero and get some possible answers for x that would satisfy this equation. To solve for x, I basically solve by undoing, which is sad map. I would subtract 2 from both sides over here. 
Divide both sides by 3. And we get x equals negative 2 thirds for a number that would turn that expression into 0. And it's true. Negative 2 thirds of 3 is negative 2 plus 2 makes this whole left yellow thing 0. 0 times 2x plus 5 would yield a product of 0. Then I would do the same thing over here, solving by undoing. Divide both sides by 2, and I get x equals negative 5 over 2. This would indeed make that whole expression equal to 0, because negative 5 halves of 2 is negative 5, plus 5 is 0. Make that parentheses 0, you made the whole thing 0. So that's the example you have recorded in your notes under the zero product property. You just take your parentheses, set them equal to zero, and solve. Okay, so now what we have are problems that we need to solve with factoring. I teach this in three steps. You only need to write the steps down one time. Step one, when we go to solve via the factoring method, You get four methods total in this section, by the way. Today we're doing two of the four. The first method is factoring. When we solve by factoring, the first step is you have to set one side equal to zero. In doing this step, you want to make sure that your A value stays positive. What I mean by that is, see this, for instance, 2x squared hanging out? The number in front of your x squared, you want to work really hard to keep that number positive because the factoring gets dodgy if you don't. So you want to make sure that you leave that a value positive. If it involves moving it to the other side, do so, is what I'm trying to tell you. So for this problem, if I want to get one side equal to zero, what I see on the right side is a three. If I want to get that three to be zero, I just need to subtract three from both sides. Balancing the equation, what I have now is 2x squared plus 9x plus 4 equals 0. So do you see how I turned one side into 0? In step 2, this is solving by factoring. So we must factor what we did in the previous step. The first method I always have to try for factoring is the GCF method. I can't take out a 2, I can't take out a 4, I can't take out a 9. There's no GCF for this trinomial. <laughs> I try the square root method. Square root of 2, x squared, oh my goodness, square root of 2 is an irrational number. Square root of 2 doesn't, uh, it's not going to work out for us. So I can't use the square root method. So what other options do I have? If this were your quiz, how would you factor that? John? Yeah, AC grouping, very good. So we take A times C. Uh, 2 times 4 is 8, right? Factors of 8 that make 9 in between. Go ahead, John. Yep. Attach x to these. I think what's funny is that, uh, you know, I record your lesson a lot of the time. This is a nice, quiet little group. I have three Johns. So if somebody's watching at home, John, John, John. Like, John answers every question. Who's John? He's, like, brilliant. There's, like, three of them. Um, so I think that's funny. That was for you at home. You hear me? Yeah. Okay. So we have 2x squared. Uh, I usually write this 9x. Uh, I rewrite it with the information I just learned about a and c, right? So I'm going to write this as 1x plus 8x plus 4. And then uh, John said it. <laughs> Grouping. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and in this first little binomial here, I see I have a common factor of x. Over here, I have a common factor of 4. Bless you. And then if I uh, go ahead and take a look, I can see that I have a common GCF there, so I'll pull that out. And then what's left over is x plus 4. And now all of this is equal to 0. So in today's lesson, we have to go one step further. After we factored, when there's an equal sign in the problem, you're responsible for solving for x. So this is why we have step three. We're going to use the ZPP. What is that? We just did it. You're mind readers, remember? What is that? Good, John. It is 
Zero product property. So this is why I had to teach you that a couple minutes ago. You got to use the ZPP, baby. All right, so we're going to take our previous part of the problem. And I noticed that these two things are multiplied together to give me zero, which means one of them or both must actually be zero. So I set 2x plus 1 equal to zero and x plus 4 equal to zero. Subtract 1 from both sides, divide both sides by 2, one of my answers is negative a half. Subtract 4 from both sides, one of my answers is negative 4. You can check with substitution, it's not too bad to do. If you square negative 4, you get 16. Uh, times 2 is 32. Uh, make that added to negative 36 and then add 7. Yeah, you definitely get 3. So these answers do actually work when you plug them back into the original equation. You can always use that to check. Let me show you another way to check though today that's even cooler. I asked you to bring your graphing calculators last week. Hopefully you remembered. But you're going to want to take those out when you get a second. All right, we're not going to write the three steps this time. We're just going to do them. So three steps for solving by factoring. Step one, you have to get one side equal to zero. Do I need to worry about that in this problem? Nah, it's already done. Sweet. On to step two. Step two, I have to solve by factoring. I have two terms with a minus sign in between them. It is so tempting to try the square root method. However, I know that 6 and 3 are not perfect squares. So that kind of doesn't work out. There's a method we're always supposed to try first, and you see I skipped over it kind of on purpose. What are you always supposed to try first? Yeah, I heard it in a couple different places. Very good, the GCF method. So I have one side equal to 0. I'm going to go ahead and take out a GCF. In this problem, I would take out a 3x. What's left over is 2x minus 1, and that's equal to 0. Folks, please understand what then, when there is no symbol in math class, we know that there's a product <laughs> between those things. So this is actually like 3x times the quantity of 2x minus 1. What I see are two things, two different factors, <coughs> multiplied together, and they give me 0. So that's where I jump into step 3, the ZPP. I'm going to go ahead and set 3x equal to 0 and 2x minus 1 equal to 0. To solve for x over here, I would just divide both sides by 3. 0 out of 3 is 0. Add 1 to both sides, divide both sides by 2, x is 1 half. So those are our two answers right there. Questions about that? Okay, so now you get to try one. There it is. Independent practice. You have to solve for me 2x squared minus 3x plus 1 equals 6. I want you to solve by factoring. And then we're going to check this together using our graphing calculators. Okay, so you're going to want to take out your calculator. And what we're going to do together is sort of verify the solutions to your problem. Um, so if you have your calculator out, um, I just need you to press the y equals button real quick. And you'll see what I have there are... Um, well, you tell me. What's up there? What do you see? You see the equation, right? Like, how so, John? Because it's not all on one line. Yeah, yeah. So, I put the left side of the equal sign in Y1, and I put the right side of the equal sign in Y2. This is a really cool trick that you're about to learn, I'm not going to lie. It's going to be handy the entire rest of the semester. Whenever we solve for x, you can always just take the left side of the equation, put it in L1, and the right side of the equation, and put it in L2. Ultimately, what are we finding? The places where the graphs meet or intersect. We're looking for the x values that these two sides of the equation have in common. So after you press graph, what you're going to see is a parabola is going to run into the horizontal line y equals 6 twice. Do you see that? We now need to ask our calculator to find those two points of intersection. So I'm going to work on the left one first. 
you're going to want to write down the keystrokes in your notes. That's the, we're in example two right now, by the way. All right, so what you're going to do is you're going to press second and calc. Um, you get to the calc menu, it's right above trace. So second and calc. You're going to go down to option five, because ultimately we're trying to find the points of intersection. Darius, pick your head up, honey. Option five. And then what I wanted to do, I wanted to find the point that's furthest to the left. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll over until I get pretty close to that first point of intersection right there. I went a little bit above it. So get as close as you can. And you're going to press enter three times. So enter, enter, enter again. Poof! One of your answers for your independent practice should have been x equals negative 1. Did you get that? Because this graph equals 6 when x equals negative 1. Do you see that? Now, we're going to go ahead and have our calculator find that other point of intersection. The other value of x where y would be 6. So you press second and calc. We're choosing option 5 for intersect. You're going to scroll over until you get pretty close to that other point of intersection. I usually go a little bit above it. That way my calculator doesn't accidentally pull in values to the left uh, towards the other point of intersection. I want to make sure it gets this one on the right. So I went a little bit above it. You press enter three times. Bam. You should have gotten five over two, which equates to two and a half. So this graph does equal or have a y value of six when x is two and a half. So you should have gotten those two answers for your independent practice. Did you get them? Good job. Okay. So I did say I was going to teach you two methods today. That was one done. I just showed you how to solve and check using factoring. Get one side equal to zero, factor, use the ZPP. Okay, next, what we're going to do is, it's called solving by undoing. Uh, so for this, we actually just use SADMET. The visual difference in the problems is that they already look like they've been factored. There's always like parentheses and then squared in them. So they've already been like factored. It's actually a form called vertex form. Um, but I'll go ahead and screen shade this for you. Oh, by the way, there's your keystrokes if you missed them. Those are the buttons we pushed to make the points of intersection happen in example two. The second trace got us to that calculate menu. We chose option five. We scrolled over to get really close to the point of intersection. And then we did have to hit enter three times. So in case you missed it, that's that information there. And then, yeah, so I just wanted to take a minute to show you solving by undoing. I teach this with one word. It's not really a word. It's called SADMET. So we go backwards through the order of operations when we solve using this technique. You can't use this technique on trinomials and things that we just did with factoring. These are already kind of, like I said, in factored form. So if you take a look, we have 4x squared equals 12. Honestly, I'm a big liar right now because this problem, you could actually get one side equal to zero, take out a GCF, and follow the previous steps. When it's a problem like this, you can pick what method you like. If you like the square root method better, hey, use it. If you like factoring better, go ahead and use it. Uh, but I recommend, um, you know, in this problem, particularly solving by undoing. You'll see the other problems look a little bit more different. Uh, but what I did is I went backwards through SADMEP. So I was like, oh, I'm going to get rid of any subtraction or addition that I see in the problem. And I'm like, oh, there is none. So that's done. Uh, all I had to do was basically undo the multiplication of 4 by dividing both sides by 4. I square rooted both sides to get rid of the exponent. That's the E in SADMET. To get rid of squared, we do square root. And then I had to include plus or minus the square root of 3 in my answer. You'll see that I went kind of quickly through that example because I think you've all done this a lot of times before. The question I have for you is, what's that plus or minus doing there? Why do I need that? Do you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you can't see what he's talking about with the square root of 3, let me draw your attention up here to like on the marker board. I have x squared equals 4. Well, there's two numbers that you could possibly square to get positive 4 back out. You could square positive 2. Positive 2 times positive 2 is positive 4. So you could square 4 and 
or I'm sorry, square two, and you get four back out. Or you could square negative two. Negative two times negative two is also positive four. So there's two numbers you could square and get four back out. We have to include both of those as answers. To do that, we just put plus or minus in front of our answer. You're all nodding like you remember that, so that's good. Um, yeah, x equals plus or minus the square root of three is our answer to this problem. Okay, SADMEP is super helpful. Like I said, when you have parentheses already hanging out in your problem and you're like, okay, well, I just want to get rid of the squared. So you'll see what I did here is I did SADMEP again, uh, with the exception of the fact that in this particular set of parentheses, there's a minus. It's not like I could add three to both sides to kick off this problem. I actually had to get rid of the exponent first because the minus is in parentheses, which comes at the end. So I did, I just jumped right on in and I square rooted both sides, made the squared go away. Then what I had is x minus three equals plus or minus the square root of seven. I highlighted it in yellow. You have to have two answers, so whenever you square root, don't forget about your plus or minus. And then I was like, oh, x isn't by itself. So I had to add three to both sides. What I will see is every once in a while I have a student who's like, oh, three plus the square root of seven, that's 10. What? Three plus the square root of seven is not 10. It's not the square root of 10 either. We get two answers out of this. Neither of them involve 10. If you did three plus the square root of seven, you get about 5.65. If you did three minus the square root of seven, you get like 0.35. So please keep in mind what you're actually finding here. Um, when you do this three plus or minus the square root of seven, those are not like terms. We're going to talk about that in the next chapter. Three and the square root of seven, one is rational and one is irrational. They're not like terms. You just kind of leave them alone if you want to write the most exact answer. So this is the best answer that I circled right here. You can't combine them. However, if you needed an approximation, if you're like, Mrs. Lucas, wh what is that? Like, what does that answer even mean? You know it is two separate answers. You have three plus the square root of seven. I just showed you on my calculator. I got 5.65. The other answer hiding out in this big circled mess, three minus the square root of seven, it's about 0.35. There's one more, and then I'm gonna go ahead and pass out your quizzes. So you can finish them up or fix them up if you'd like. I have x minus five squared minus 100 equals zero. I added 100 to both sides, and then I was like, woohoo, square root of 100, that's pretty. Square root of 100 is going to be plus or minus 10 on the right side. I then added 5 to both sides, and I went to go write it. Did you see what I did? I wrote it like I did in the previous problem. I was like, oh, it's 5 plus or minus 10. But you can't leave me an answer that looks like that. 5 and 10 are like terms, so you have to simplify that. One of your answers is 5 plus 10, which is 15. The other one is 5 minus 10, which is negative 5. Those are the best answers there. So do you see there's a little bit of a contrast between B and C. Sometimes it's okay to just leave that plus or minus in your answer, but if you can go a little bit further, you should. What's up, Darius? Okay. Any other questions? After you finish this, there are independent practice and conclusion questions on the next page. If you'd like to take some time, I'm going to pass the quizzes out to everybody. If you're done with it, you can just bring it right back up to my desk, put it right in my bed. And then you can work on your independent practice conclusion questions. If you're a person who's going to take a little bit more time and look at their quiz one more time a little bit longer, then you have to finish the independent practice questions, conclusion questions on your own for homework. Those should be done. So you want to make sure you finish those up. And then we'll start uh, completing the square tool.